oder? Doch. Es kommt irgendwann noch. Ähm, Im Skript ist allerdings das erste Kapitel nicht dabei. Ja, nee, das ist heute auch noch. Ich hoffe, dass ich fertig werde heute damit. Ich bezweifle es. Ich bezweifle es sehr. Ist eigentlich ausgeschlossen. So, good afternoon. Welcome to Renewable Energies. Just one student uh, here today. Uh, I think it's okay. Yeah, so uh, we enhance the technology here. So uh, the students who are present here, they don't see me on. Uh, they don't. They only see me live, and no longer on the on the screen. But you at home, you should see me. Uh, if this is uh, not the case, then we would have a problem. And I hope you hear me. Um, actually, you have the opportunity to use the chat. And actually, there will be a ring do, uh, tone that reminds me that somebody wrote something in uh, the chat. Alex o uh, already tried it out. And uh, he asked whether uh, it, the bell was, was ringing, and it did. Don't abuse it, otherwise I have to switch it off. Yeah? So if they are, if they are uh, funny uh, and uh, just senseless uh, chats, then I would have to switch it off. Okay, what did we do last time? Let me give a brief recap. We discussed um, energy terms, energy terminolo terminology, namely the most important were primary energy and then final energy. And we said that final energy, that the concept of final energy is of importance because Final energy is very easy to measure. You just need to look up your utility bills or uh, any other bills um, that correspond to, say, um, going to the filling station or, or whatsoever. So end energy or final energy is easy to measure. More important is primary energy because it kind of measures the footprint, our ecological footprint at least as long as we subtract the renewable energies. And this can, of course, be done. Now, the question is how to get from one to the other. And I explained that, um, that there are the primary energy factors uh, with, with which this is accomplished. Um, there are different ways to establish these primary energy um, factors, and the one that I discussed um, is uh, called in German Wirkungsgradprinzip, efficiency principle. In English, the um, technical term is physical energy content principle or something like that. Yeah, so doesn't that really make sense to me? But uh, anyway, um, we also discussed that, um, that um, a way of calculating it by by um, just determining how many conventional energy renewables substitute. So this would be the substitution uh, method would be more appropriate. But people decided uh, otherwise, and we speculated a little bit uh, why this is so. And uh, this pretty much was the end of, um, of the last lecture. And I started with giving you uh, a little bit of a flavor uh, of what brought me into this, um, to this lecture. So uh, this is not my research top, uh, topic, uh, what, I, what I teach here. Um, so rather there um, is a story of personal interest, also of um, political interest, of course. Um, but there is also one of, um, of a disappointment. And uh, this is what I would like to tell you now. So what you see here, what you see here is, um, is the windmill that you, that you see when you drive to Munich. I uh, showed it last time already. It was built pretty much, well, pretty, a little bit more than 20 years ago in 1999. I looked it up so you can find this windmill even on, um, in Wikipedia because it's so prominent. 
So it's uh, built here on this landfill. Yeah, so they also call it the uh, Fritmaning Hill. Uh, but it's actually just a, a huge landfill, what they have in the north of Munich there. Um, and when I saw it, um, I, uh, yeah, so I liked this machine, I have to say. But nevertheless, I considered it, um, well, a helpless cry. Yeah, because I never believed that it can make any significant contribution to, um, to the energy problems that we have. Um, well, just a fun fact about uh, this windmill. Um, ten years ago or so, during the Christmas season, they put, uh, they attached LEDs to the to the rotor blades, and so they had a Christmas star uh, running there for uh, well till the end of that year. Well, what I believed actually at that time uh, was that the only way to cope with the CO2 crisis, which I actually knew uh, since my, well, since my, since my teenager time. Um, so this was a problem, and we'll come perhaps back to that at some point. So uh, the CO2 problem uh, was, uh, I was very aware of that at that time, and I thought that the only solution uh, would be nuclear energy. Well, we ha didn't have Wikipedia at that time, otherwise, I quickly would have looked up uh, and convinced myself uh, to the contrary. So what you see here is the electricity production by nuclear power plants in Germany. And um, what you see is, well, um, that, um, that it's actually not much as compared to the total electricity production in Germany. Yeah, so um, it has never been more than 20% and it was going down and down. Well, uh, not in absolute numbers, but in, uh, in, uh, in the ratio, uh, because the uh, energy consumption grew. And the same is actually true for the entire world. Yeah, so it was once a little bit more than 10%, uh, and it decreased now to, uh, to much smaller numbers. So it's quite clear. Um, we would have to build many, many nuclear power plants in order, to, in order to save the world with nuclear power. But then consider um, the nuclear waste problem uh, would, of course, yeah, so if we expand it by a factor of 10, which would be necessary, um, then also the nuclear waste problem would be a factor of 10 higher. The story went on in the following way. Um, I was appointed as a professor in Texas, at Texas A&M University, um, and uh, each month, month I would get uh, the physics magazine, Physics Today, and this was in 2005, and I remember very well that I was sitting in my office reading or just yeah, scanning through, um, through this magazine, and um, I saw this article which really uh, surprised me. Yeah, so in this article, there was a report, a small report on a, on a, on a, sci a scientific paper by these two authors here who mapped out the potential of wind energy in the world. And they came to the conclusion um, that the wind map shows that certain percent of all sites considered meet the criterion of being economical, first of all and that um, there would be, and these um, sites would um, actually cover the world energy needs by, by a factor of seven or so, right? So the details of this study yeah, uh, are controversial. Not everybody agrees, so they may be off by, by a factor of two or three or so. Um, on the other hand, they looked at the problem um, with wind, um, mill access heights of, uh, of 80 meters, and nowadays we are at um, 120 meters or so. Um, so there's a lot, um, yeah, so there's a lot of potential. Yeah? Why was I so surprised? Well, because of this book here, which I bought as a, as a high school student. It was far too difficult for me, uh, I have to say, immediately. Um, but I also scanned through this book, uh, book and read the one or other part of it, 
And um, well, uh, at that time at least I had uh, a very good memory. So I remembered very well what I read in that, uh, in that book. And it's written here in German, uh, but I uh, translate it here. So what it said and what I remembered, uh, and surely and sure enough I would look it up immediately, so also the exploitation of wind energy can at best cover a few percent of the energy demand of modern industrialized states. There is in fact some interest to use them for local demand. Formerly, they were referred to as windmills, yeah, so these uh, uh, wind power plants. Then it goes on and says, the efficiency may be defined as the ratio of the actual power coefficient, we'll come to that, what this means, uh, the power coefficient, to the maximum possible. So we'll derive this maximum uh, possible power coefficient in this lecture. Um, however, this efficiency, uh, the authors say, is of minor significance as wind energy is available in arbitrary amount. The profitability can only be assessed according to the ratio of power to the cost incurred. Well then, as a high school student, I just accepted that. I didn't think. Yeah, but if you think about it, then you see that, uh, that this is nonsense, what they write. They are, um, it is contradictory. Yeah, so the first contradic uh, contradiction is that they say that wind energy is available in arbitrary amounts, but it can only cover a few percent. Yeah? So <laughs> the other is that efficiency plays no role. Right? This is, of course, also nonsense. The higher the efficiency, um, the more electricity you can produce at pretty much the same costs usually. Yeah? So usually uh, the technical, uh, technical progress is what drives costs down. Right? And this is a frequent mistake uh, they make. Um, I just read today uh, another example of that where somebody wrote just yeah, 10 years ago that he is sure that um, the efficiency of, uh, of solar cells, of photovoltaic cells, will not increase much beyond 10%. And today we are 20%. Yeah? Well, it can't go beyond 30% easily because there are physical limits, but this is, was, was my lecture in the, last, um, in, the, in the last semester. Well, this book uh, I bought when I was a high school student, and I think it was the eighth edition um, the persons that you see here are actually quite famous person. Yeah? Uh, whom you see here is Brandl, a very, f uh, a, a really famous uh, physicist, Ludwig Brandl, right? And here you see his successor. Uh, this is Betz, and he plays a particular role in in the theory of wind energy. Um, Brandl didn't write this, what, what's written here, yeah, but you see a few other persons who took over to continue this book, and it's, um, it, it is still published now, I think, in the 14th uh, edition or so. Um, and so I looked up the 14th edition to find out what they would write today, and guess, guess what they write? Hmm? A couple more percent. A couple of more percent. No, they actually take serious what they said. And so there's no, uh, no longer wind energy in this book. <laughs> they left it out. <laughs> so in this book on uh, continuum mechanics, uh, there's no longer, there's wind energy was deleted. Yeah, so this is consequent. Um, I love it. Yeah, so this is this. Um, this is this uh, book here. Um, my other encounter with wind energy is the following. What you see here is the Grovian. This is an acronym and means Große Windanlage. And um, this was the German bit uh, to build a megawatt um, scale wind power plant. Yeah, so they built it and um, I remember well um, 
that it was a it was a complete disaster. This windmill, um, I have to say, yeah, it was a complete disaster, and it was switched off soon after the transition from the government of Helmut Schmidt to Helmut Kohl. So in the early 1980s, yeah, you are, for for you students, this is this is history long ago. But uh, I was a high school student at that time, um, and one of the first. Um, actions, uh, one of the first decisions by the Secretary of Research, um, and this was Heinz Riesenhuber, uh, he was a very good Secretary of Research, I have to say, um, one of his first uh, actions was to shut this windmill down. Yeah? Because uh, it was running, uh, it, most of the time it was broken, right? And uh, so uh, they switched it off. When I looked this up uh, recently, um, I I was intrigued by these two, um, yeah, by these two masts here, and I was wondering f uh, f what their purpose was. Yeah. Um, yeah, so one said that um, that they would measure the wind, wind speeds, uh, yeah, so that they have wind uh, speed measurement devices on this uh, on this tower. Yeah, makes sense. But why do I need a second one? Right. Uh, well, uh, what they did is that they put um, a net in between in order to prevent the birds from hitting the windmill. Well, and then there I thought, well, it, it seems they, they built it to make it fail. Yeah? So they took care of problems that uh, that uh, that, were, that were, were not there, and so here is a here is a statistics. I took it from the book by David McKay, Sustainable Energy uh, Without the Hot Air. You can get this book um, as a PDF on uh, on the internet. Well, and there you see um, what kills the birds. Yeah? So windmills uh, in Denmark, yeah, in Denmark they have a lot of windmills, cars, buildings are not uh, even mentioned here, and then you have, uh, yeah, you have uh, the favorite animal also in Germany, right? So, and buildings uh, kill a similar amount of, of birds. Well, I don't want to say that um, windmills are irrelevant for for some endangered uh, species, yeah, so this may well be, and that one needs to take uh, care of that. Um, but in general, uh, this is of course not true, and I'm one week too late. Um, but um, this is uh, this is a um, uh, yeah an anecdote from from uh, one of the presidential uh, debates, yeah, and uh, Trump is usually lying about everything, yeah? So, uh, I know more about, Trump said, I know more about wind than you do. It's extremely expensive, kills all the birds, and is very intermittent, yeah? So, that's the only right thing that, yeah, or fairly right thing. Uh, it's got a lot of problems, and they happen to make the windmills, yeah, and this is the worst part for Trump, in Germany and in China. Which is actually also not true. Yeah, so the US they have quite some wind industry. Anyway, so um, well, but now if you look in Wikipedia, the Grovian, yeah, then you read actually, then you read actually that it was that it's true that they build it to fail. Yeah, and uh, here are two quotes. Uh, one by an ex executive of one of the companies that built it. Yeah, so this is a utility, uh, so a, a utility uh, company here. Um, Rheinisch, Rheinisch Westfälische Elektrizitätswerke, I think it stands for. And, um, and he had to justify himself why uh, his company financed uh, building the Grovian. And he said, we need Grovian. We need it in order to prove that it doesn't work. Grovian is something like a pedagogical model in order to 
uh, in order to, um, to, to show to the uh, opponents of nuclear power uh, to um, convert them to the right belief, right? And um, the, 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 uh, the secretary of, um, um, of, of the budget yeah, and um, primary and, um, and also secretary of, of research, Hans Matthöfer in the cabinet of, of Helmut Schmidt, he is, um, was quoted similarly. Yeah, we know that it, doesn't, uh, that it does not have any use but we do it in order to prove to the supporters of wind energy that it doesn't work. Well, but one should never, um, um, one should never blame people without looking at oneself. So this is actually a study by the German Physical Society. And um, in 2011, they also stayed that the potential of wind energy is more or less exhausted. Yeah. And yeah, attend this lecture and perhaps afterwards you are able to have your own uh, opinion on that. Well, uh, the other thing that surprised me um, was um, how much photovoltaics, uh, so how quickly photovoltaics be, uh, became competitive. So when the red-green government in the cabinet of uh, Gerhard Schröder came to office, um, they, actually, um, they actually installed a program which was called the 100,000 roof program. So, um, people could, um, could buy a, a photovoltaic um, plant, uh, put them on their roof, and they would get as much as 53 or so euro cent per kilowatt hour. Now, of course, photovoltaics was very expensive, but this was guaranteed for 20 years. Actually, my brother uh, bought one and put it on uh, the roof um, uh, of his farm. Um, and uh, he's pretty happy with that. Yeah? And many people did that, and there were programs following that 100,000 roof program, and this was the start of a steep decline in costs of, uh, of photovoltaics. And today, uh, it is competitive, and uh, already here in this article from uh, 2009, you see that uh, Physics World yeah, so the UK version of physics today, so to say, they say that solar power edges to grid parity, which means that um, solar power plants can produce electricity as cheap as conventional, um, as conventional power plants. Well, in this case, of course, in the US at very sunny places, um, and of course, there's a big difference in, uh, to Germany, uh, but nevertheless, also in Germany, we have, um, we, have, um, we have grid parity, meanwhile, actually since years. Okay, with this, um, a short outline before we continue um, to what we'll do. Um, we'll continue with chapter one and um, say a few more statistical and, and other things uh, that are necessary or that are at least useful for background information. Um, but then we'll do real physics, yeah? not just economy and, um, yeah, and things of lesser interest. <laughs> um, but uh, we want to do real physics. And uh, the first thing would be that we look at the basic principles of the energy balance of planets. So the idea is kind of to calculate the surface temperature of Earth with very simple um, arguments. Uh, very simple concepts. It's a very rough model, I have to admit. Um, it's extremely rough, but uh, it contains actually the, the essence of also uh, the greenhouse effect. Then we'll talk about a f um, a spe a spe um, at a special type of a, of a, um, of a heat engine. Yeah, so you certainly know 
uh, reversible heat engines uh, like the Stirling engine or the Canot engine, right? No? No? Um, okay, then uh, I have to take a small detour and, and uh, intro introduce this. Um, and then we'll talk about generation of wind in the atmosphere because what we will do is to, to treat actually the globe as a, as a heat engine. Yeah, kind of funny. Yeah, um, but th this is uh, what it is after all. Yeah, so there is um, there's there's heat um, coming from the sun, um, and there's a cold reservoir, namely space. And uh, in this way, one can approximate um, the atmosphere as a heat engine. And then uh, we'll uh, treat the theory of ideal wind turbines. This is exactly the theory that Betts, whom I just mentioned, um, introduced. Yeah? And we'll do this in some detail. We'll also uh, consider the losses that a windmill um, suffers. Right? So you can't, you can't uh, convert the entire kinetic energy um, of, uh, of wind into mechanical energy and thus into electricity. Um, this comes out even for an ideal wind turbine that you can use only two thirds about. Yeah? 16 over 27 to, pre, uh, to be precise. Yeah? We can calculate that analytically, but we can do more. We can actually calculate the shape of the blades um, of these windmills. And we can even do, we can even do more. Namely, we can calculate which fraction of the ideal windmill is in fact possible. Yeah? And we'll find that less than 50% of the kinetic en energy of wind can actually be converted into, into electricity. And then if you look at real windmills, if you look at, the spe at, their, spe at their specs, then you find that we are, yeah, that we are um, pretty much exactly at, at this number within a few percent or so. Yeah, so quite remarkable. So you will have a, a good understanding of a windmill um, after, this, after this lecture and a few other things, I hope. So teaching assistants you uh, know already. Um, this is Martin Bayer. Um, uh, Yun Yu Chang, this is not true. So this is uh, something left over from, <laughs> from last time. Um, Grading, I don't know yet. Yeah, so uh, one uh, student asked me via email. I'm sorry that I didn't uh, respond, but I, I answer the question here. Um, I'm not sure how to do it um, because we don't have teaching assistants um, uh, this semester because of the corona crisis, um, strangely enough. Um, and um, so probably there will be just a final. Yeah? So you would turn in, um, well, you don't need to turn in the homework, but uh, I can only encourage you to do the homework because uh, the problems on the final will be at least by 50% homework problems. Yeah? And another 25% will be close to homework problems, and then there's another 25% that we invent freshly or we use earlier uh, homework problems from previous uh, semesters. A few books that, um, that are interesting, and some of them I use, actually. So, uh, of course, I use this book here by uh, Gash and Twele, Wind Power Plants. Yeah? And uh, yeah, so when I learned uh, the subject or this material for the first time, I was really, uh, yeah, so I, I, I was really delighted because uh, the theory of, uh, of windmills, at least in my opin opinion, is so beautiful. Um, then I learned a, a few things from this, uh, from this book here. I'm uh, currently reading uh, this book here. Well, this is not a physics book, I would say. Yeah? So if you read it, yeah, it's a little bit strange for a physicist that somebody would mention here Excel um, um, functions in a book and calculate something with Excel functions. For example, the slope of some, um, of some line. 
Um, but anyway, it's, uh, it's interesting, and I'll show um, one example from this book today, and, um, well, um, more detailed, much more detailed information than I'll cover on the um, climate uh, problem is actually um, covered in this book. I think we should open the window for, for two minutes or so, because we should do this every 20 minutes or so. I can also open this one here. Yeah. Okay, so with this, um, I would continue here and, uh, and talk a little bit about energy consumption and, uh, and demand. So this should be now visible. Yeah, it uh, should be visible here and there. Um, first, a few words on, on units. Yeah, so um, let's introduce the units. So they use all kinds of units. Uh, in this, uh, in energy economy. And so I would like to say two sentences about, um, yeah. so I think this is enough. Yeah, so airing a room is a good idea in the corona crisis. So uh, I did a little bit of uh, physics exercises on that last weekend. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's also interesting actually. So um, the unit I will use preferentially is actually the kilowatt hour. The kilowatt hour because it's so familiar to us. Um, so kilowatt hours is how we actually, um, yeah, so for the man on the street, for the private user, for the private consumer, the kilowatt hour is an appropriate unit. If you take a tool, yeah, then a tool uh, is, is very, very small. Yeah? Uh, uh, 3.6 million joules is a kilowatt hour. And a kilowatt hour costs approximately, depending on what it is, well, uh, if it is electricity, 30 euro cents in Germany. Yeah? Pretty expensive. Um, in other countries, much uh, cheaper. But anyway, yeah? so the kilowatt hour um, is as a convenient unit as is the euro, I would say, if you compare it to a, to a national economy. So in a national economy, we would not talk about one euro, but we would talk about a billion euro, right? Billion euro for the German um, uh, students here. Billion in the US means milliarde in, in German. Yeah? Um, so, National budgets are counted in billion units, and therefore, um, well, and interestingly, also um, national energy consumptions will also be counted in billion kilowatt hours. Yeah? So in this way, I find it very instructive to use um, the kilowatt hour. Yeah? So um, we will use, we will mostly use Um, the kilowatt hour um, as a unit yeah, because um, it is because uh, well one kilowatt hour is um, as appropriate for private consumption um, as, as one euro. And, um, and similarly, One billion, and I use the German abbreviation for billion, yeah, so milliarde, one kilowatt hour, um, one billion kilowatt hour is a good unit 
for national energy economics. Yeah. Um, analogously, to um, one billion euro for a national budget. Yeah. Um, to give you an example, um, the national budget of Germany um, yeah, so national budget of Germany is approximately 350 billion euros. Yeah, so this is only the federal budget. Of course, there are also the states and so on, so it's probably a thousand billions or so. Yeah? Um, if you contrast this to the primary energy consumption, so the primary energy consumption of Germany is roughly 4,000 billion kilowatt hours. Yeah, so 4,400 billion kilowatt hours. Yeah, and if you prefer um, conventional physics units, yeah, so then it is of course clear that a billion kilowatt hour is equal to one terawatt hour. If you look into statistics by various organizations, then they use a whole bunch of different units. And, um, well, um, I Mention two of them, other units. Yeah, so uh, you can, of course, use um, the tool, and then you would use usually the peta tool, and this would be, uh, this is 0 0.277 billion kilowatt hours, or you can use the mega ton of oil equivalent, yeah? and then if you look up the higher heating value, so the Brennwert of, uh, of oil, um, then you find that you get uh, 11.63 billion kilowatt hours. Yeah? So you see they also uh, use uh, units that are kind of convenient so that you have numbers in the, yeah, in, um, numbers that, that, that are somehow um, handy. Yeah? Okay, well, let's compare this to the primary energy consumption of the entire world. Yeah? So, um, the current primary energy consumption of the world is estimated to, to be roughly 1.6 times 10 to the 5, well, in this units, billion kilowatt hours. Yeah? And I have here two slides showing that. Two slides showing that. Um, so here you see um, the, um, the primary energy consumption, the global primary energy consumption um, over 200 years. Yeah? And you see that in the first 100 years or so, not much happened. And it was pre pretty much more or less wood, what was burned, right? Traditional biomass. This is where this is how people uh, got their energy. And then, um, um, starting in England actually, uh, the use of coal started, um, having a lot, of, a lot to do uh, with the invention or with the improvement rather of the, of the steam engine. Right? And then in the 20th century, um, oil took over and actually coal is starting to, to decrease. 
um, which is actually nicely described in this book uh, on energy economy that, that I just presented. Uh, very interesting to read. Um, then we have natural gas, which um, gets dominant or seems to get dominant now. Right? There's a little bit of nuclear. Right? So here you see how much nuclear contributes. And if somebody tells you that nuclear would be the solution, then just show him this here, right? Uh, at least not on a global uh, scale can be there. Well, and then there are renewables uh, still also very, very small, but uh, quickly growing. So here's a more expanded view of the entire, uh, of this thing, starting not 200 years ago, but something like 30 years ago. Yeah? And um, you see, of course, a similar trend. Um, yeah, um, nuclear, 4% here. So they use other colors here, right? Here, red is natural gas, yeah, so unfortunately. Um, and, uh, and you see um, that, um, that the renewables here in orange, that they grow very quickly. Yeah, so there's the, their contribution is still small but they grow very quickly. So um, maybe we just um, copy this um, thing um, here, uh, this here. Doesn't work. Ah, yeah. So this thing here. Uh, so here you see how um, the share of each of the uh, energy carriers is. Um, well, the other the thing to compare it with is is of course the world population. So the world population, these are 7.8 billion people. And from this, we can calculate the average. The average doesn't mean much, of course, yeah, because some use a lot of energy and others almost nothing. Um, there's no justice, of course. Ah, yeah. I have to show this. Nobody complained via the, via the chat so far. Um, so 20,000 kilowatt hours per person per capita. Yeah? And this we may want to compare to the, to the energy that we re receive from sun. Yeah? So um, let's just see how much ener energy we get from sun. So comparison to the total radiation Earth receives from sun. Yeah. And for this, we use the so-called solar constant. Everybody should know that, at least after you have attended this course. And I mention this because in quite a few exams, um, people, strangely enough, don't know that. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, yeah, so even without uh, attending this course, one should know that. So the solar constant, which is the energy flux density, so the energy flux, the power, per square meter. The solar constant um, outside the atmosphere is 1,367 watts per square meter. Yeah? Then we have, um, 
Yeah, then not everything goes through the um, through the atmosphere, and um, a part is reflected, so it's not absorbed by the Earth. Yeah, um, and this you can take into account by the so-called albedo. This is the kind of reflectivity uh, of Earth, and it is pretty exactly 30%, um, which means that 950 watts per square meter are absorbed by Earth. Well, of course, just the projected area of the Earth. Right? So let's calculate the projected area, projected surface of Earth. Yeah, the Earth is a disk, as everybody knows. We use this here again. Well, I have to be careful with saying such things. We are on YouTube, and certainly some people will discover that. Um, but anyway, um, we calculate that um, Earth radius is uh, 6,000 kilometers approximately, and then we get 1.13 times 10 to the 14 square meters. Yeah? And what we then get is a power absorbed by the Earth, which is one point, uh, pretty much 1.0 times 10 to the 17 watts, right? And this is a factor of almost 10,000, more precisely a factor of 6,000 larger than the primary energy consumption of the world. Yeah? This is a factor of 6,000 larger than the primary energy consumption, the global primary energy consumption. Good. Yeah. So let's come to Germany. Yeah, I'll frequently take it as an example. Um, you can exchange Germany for every uh, for every uh, other industrialized countries, you won't find much difference. Yeah? Um, so I, I take it, yeah, because we are in Germany, why not? Yeah? Um, so for Germany, private energy consumption of Germany. Um, and this is currently Um, this is currently actually 3,560 uh, billion kilowatt hours. Yeah, I wrote a different number um, just a few minutes ago. Um, this is the this is actually the the present number, and it it is down from from roughly 4,000 billion kilowatt hours down from, yeah. Why is it down from 4,000? So why did it decrease 10, 20 percent or something like that? Well, the reason is that energy efficiency indeed grew. But the other reason is what I explained last, um, what I explained last uh, lecture, namely that uh, a, a larger share of renewable energies uh, is, uh, is in the statistics, and um, the primary energy factors of, um, of renewables is just one, whereas for, um, for other energy carriers, it is higher. For example, if you replace nuclear, then each kilowatt hour goes in there with a factor with three kilowatt hours. Um, yeah, so, and this uh, also becomes apparent if we look at the final energy consumption because this didn't decrease a lot. 
Yeah, so the final energy consumption did not decrease a lot. It decreased a little bit. Um, accordingly, I should write. Yeah. So what we see is largely an effect um, of a larger share of renewables together um, with the, and I put it in brackets here, with the questionable method of accounting um, using the efficiency method or the precise term is physical energy content method. Yeah? So using the physical energy content method. And the German term for that, I mentioned it, is Wirkungsgrad Prinzip. Yeah. So if you look on what are the important sources, then you find that's, well, a third is oil, a quarter is natural gas. So there's a question. I suppose when talking about the consumption of X kilowatt hours, oh yeah. Yes, uh, there's a question by Jonathan uh, Bollick, and he asks, I suppose, when talking about the consumption of so and so much kilowatt hours, the time scale is a, is a year. That's correct. Yeah, thank you for that question. I should have, uh, I should have said that, or, uh, of course. Um, yeah. So, once again, um, worldwide, Coal is a quarter, natural gas is a quarter, oil is a third or so, nuclear just 4%, uh, renewables also just 4%, and hydro a little bit. Yeah. In Germany, things are pretty much the same um, with uh, yeah, a few modifications. Yeah. Oil is a third, natural gas is a quarter about, coal is a little bit less than a quarter. Um, there's 6% nuclear. Yeah, so we still have, or well, this year it's probably changes probably, um, and there is 13 percent renewables, whereas worldwide it's just four percent. Yes, so uh, not so um, so different. Another aspect that's important if we talk about the primary energy consumption and the challenges to the world is, of course, the development of the population of, um, um, of the globe. Because if population um, increases, then sooner or later also the, uh, the primary energy consumption increases. So, um, and this would be the final remark here in this subchapter. So the development of population numbers okay before we discuss that um, a slide here um, discussing a slide here discussing the primary energy consumption in Germany yeah so uh, what you see are the actual numbers until the year 2018 or 19. 
Yeah? And this, these are the political projections. Yeah? So this is, this is what they hope. Right? This is the plan of the government. Yeah? So for 2050 or so. Um, and what, uh, the rest what you see is just what, I, what we discussed. Yeah? Um, we also discussed this already. Um, it is clear that depending on where you are, the energy consumption per person, and of course also per year, is vastly different from country to country. Um, so what you see with this green curve, yeah, so this is North America, so uh, the US and Canada basically, um, Germany is, I think, is this curve here, or Europe. Yeah, so this is Europe here. Yeah, so we use approximately half of that. We'll have another curve for that. Yeah, Middle East grows up like this. This here is interesting, isn't it? Yeah, so this is, this is the total commonwealth of independent states. What's, what is this? The commonwealth of independent states. Hmm? No, it's not the British Empire. This is the former Soviet uh, Union here. Yeah? And uh, now you understand this curve, right? What happens in the 90s. Uh, so they went so down. Okay, and uh, the red curve is total Africa. Yeah? Okay, I mentioned this already. Yeah, so you can also put this in nice numbers. Yeah, so you can ask yourself, yeah, so what is the average power that we have running in Germany? Yeah, so this is uh, 460 gigawatts. Then you can calculate the average power per capita. Yeah, so the average power for each of us. And this is something like 5.5 kilowatts per person, which means that about seven, eight horses are working for each of us day and night. Yeah, so with this you can imagine how much energy we are using. And if you, um, if you sum that up over a year, uh, no, uh, if you sum that up over a day, then we spend each day approximately 130 um, kilowatt hours. And this here is a comparison to the U US. Yeah, they need approximately twice as much, um, which was uh, actually also apparent already from the previous, um, from the previous, from one of the previous slides. But the US are very different actually from Germany, which you can see at this at the development of the population. Yeah, on the um, on the right hand side, you see um, the development of German population. Yeah, so we are currently at um, well, a um, little bit more than uh, 80 million. Well, whereas in the U.S. you have uh, um, well um, a steep increase uh, still. Um, so the both economies uh, work entirely different, um, economic growth and so on and so forth. So and here is the slide that I wanted to show. Uh, here concerning the world population forecasts. Yeah? And it depends, of course, a lot on where uh, we are. Right? In Europe, it tends to go down. Um, in, uh, in Africa, in, uh, where is Africa? Yeah? So in Africa, it uh, increases, of course. And um, worldwide, it looks like that. Yeah? And um, the expectation is that it saturates somewhere at 11, 12 billion people. And actually, uh, the most convincing um, well, data and kind of theory um, I saw in this book uh, that I mentioned, yeah, so energy supply and demand, where um, they choose actually a, a remarkable way to plot it. Yeah, so the, here, uh, the annual growth rate is plotted. The annual growth rate of the population is plotted. And you see that it goes down, but it's plotted against the population in billions. Yeah? So um, 
And uh, what one sees is that there is a, well, more or less linear uh, dependence. And now if you extrapolate, then you come indeed to the, um, to the 12 billion people. And they use this kind of analysis for also other problems. So, uh, for example, for the forecast on how long our coal reservoirs would last. Yeah, and the predictions are, are pretty precise. Um, unless there would uh, be some, well, technological breakthrough um, that we saw, for example, for, for natural gas, then, of course, um, such models uh, fail. OK, anyway, let's quickly write that down. This way. Yeah, so let's uh, quickly write that down. Um, the current world population is 7.8 billion people. And it is expected, and hopefully this is, will become true, that it will saturate between 11 and 12 billion people. So with this, I come to the, to the next chapter, namely to the so-called energy sectors and the Sankey diagrams. Yeah. But before we do that, we quickly open the window for two minutes or so. And I write the headline already. So 1.3 energy sectors, and I largely discuss this at the example of Germany, and Sankey diagrams. It's cold outside, isn't it? Yesterday I attended uh, the Klang der Stolpersteine, uh, and it was wow, it was so cold, and it was so uh, humid. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing was, uh, well, with the mask you always get um, um, uh, moist to, the, to to your glasses, but even if you would um, put it uh, the glasses off and shake it in the air, it wouldn't disappear. It was very foggy, yeah, so this was the problem. OK, good. So, um, so in energy economy, we distinguish four sectors. Yeah? And these four sectors are industry, transportation, private households, and commerce and services. In German, we call uh, this fourth sector Gewerbe, Handel und Dienstleistungen, GHD. And I will use this abbreviation. So commerce and service, I will, services I will abbreviate with GHD. Yeah? So um, let's take um, a respective note. So in energy economy, we distinguish four sectors, namely industry, private households,
then transportation. and commerce and services. Yeah. GHD standing for Gewerbe, Handel und Dienstleistungen. Yeah, also our foreign students should learn a little bit of German. So, and this is the German lesson for today. Um, in Germany, each of these sectors has, has a, well, a roughly, a very roughly equal share in primary energy consumption. And I have a graph for this. So where is it? It's this one here. Yeah. So what you see here is industry. Yeah, so I said approximately a quarter. Well, it's more a third or so. Then transportation, yeah, not quite, a little bit less than a quarter. Then we have private households, pretty much uh, one quarter. And commerce and services is a little bit less. And then we have this here which is non-energetic use and um, export. Yeah, so Germany still exports um, energy, for example, wind energy. Yeah. Um, so, um, but just to remember it, so each of these sectors Um, use approximately, very approximately, uh, one quarter of the total primary energy consumption. Yeah? And of course, if you ask now, um, what are the energy sources for each of these sectors, then there are, of course, huge differences. And for this, um, I have a slide. Yeah. So here you see a very busy slide, actually. Yeah. Um, so you see the total, um, the total picture here, similar to what, um, what I drew up here. I hope it's the same colors. Yes, I tried to do that, and uh, it worked, yeah. Um, and now you have the four sectors here. This is transportation. Yeah, and even so, the, uh, the letters are f much too small in order to be readable. Here, you, uh, you know, of course, what this here means. Yeah? Yeah? If this can only be oil. Yeah? So the transportation runs on oil. Yeah? It uses oil and oil and nothing, uh, uh, almost nothing else. Yeah? But we can look uh, at it um, in more detail. Yeah, so here you see it. Yeah, so there's a little bit electricity for uh, railway and so on. There's also a little bit of gas uh, for some cars uh, and so on and so forth. Now let's go to industry. Industry uses a lot of energy in order to, um, to produce mechanical work. Yeah? Um, and to this end, yeah, they use a lot of electricity. Yeah, so this drives the motors and so on and so forth. But they also need to heat their, um, their um, uh, plant halls yeah, or process heat and, what, um, and, and all these things. Yeah? So uh, next, um, GHD, Commerce and Services. Yeah? Again, heating, producing hot air, heating rooms is a, is a big part. Uh, another big part is, of course, and for this they need electricity, computers and things like that. Yeah? Um, lightning uh, rooms, well, it's actually a smaller part. Um, and, well, heating rooms with gas, and, but also with mineral uh, oil. 
And finally, private households. Actually, uh, very interesting. Um, private households, they use uh, most of the energy, by far most of the energy, for heating the house. And this you see here. Um, so, um, well, this is actually um, for the entire industry. Um, here, uh, the same thing for private homes. Um, yeah, private homes here, right? So we use most of the energy that we consume in private homes, and two thirds actually, we use just for heating, and another 14% to produce hot water. Yeah? And all the rest is, well, I wouldn't say negligible, but almost negligible. Yeah? So the big bill is heating rooms. And actually, this is true for the entire economy. So if you look at this here, um, then you also find that one half of the primary energy is used for heating something, either for heating offices or plants or whatsoever, for producing hot water, for process heat. I think this here is process heat. Um, and then this here would be mecha mechanical energy, yeah? driving, running motors, electric motors. Yeah? Okay, let's write that up. Yeah, so this is actually an important lesson. Um, when you want to discuss energy issues with colleagues or with um, people uh, who have no idea of, uh, of physics, uh, then it's uh, always important to know what are the important parts of the energy economy. Right? And uh, now you have seen one, yeah? so you have seen one big bill in the, entire, in the entire budget. And this big bill, this is heating. So some 50% or so is used for producing, well, if I put it polemically, then I would say for producing hot air. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, we have to, another question is here arriving. Black screen for classroom stream. Yeah, um, iPad, this way, right? Okay, so um, to wrap up what we said before, the share of the energy sources differ a lot between sectors, between energy sectors. Yeah. And the obvious example we mentioned, this is transportation which uses almost exclusively oil. But of course, yeah, also heating, ho um, so if you know that most of the energy in private uh, households is actually used for heating, then you know that there are two things, oil, which is decreasing, and natural gas. Yeah? And hopefully renewables uh, in the future, um, but uh, actually not uh, a lot so far. Okay, the um, other important message that we had, more than 50% of the final energy consumption is used to produce heat. Yeah? And why is this important? This is important because heat is a low quality energy. What you do actually by, by heating is that you convert high quality, or that what you usually do is that you convert high quality energy into low quality energy. 
Yeah, so you burn gas, which um, is uh, high quality energy, and you um, create heat at a low temperature, you know, which um, implies that uh, the entropy, so you produce a lot of entropy by heating. Yeah? And this is, um, this is relevant in so far as you could um, actually do things also differently. What you could do uh, would be to burn gas in a motor and produce electricity and just use the exhaust heat to heat your home. Yeah? A Blockheitskraftwerk, as we call them in Germany. Uh, I would have to look up what it means in English. Um, there will be once a, a homework problem on that. Yeah? So, um, to produce heat, yeah, heat is is low quality energy. Yeah, a colloquial way to say that you produce entropy. Yeah, and um, the numbers are 30% for space heating. Five percent for hot water, and twenty percent for process heat. For example, in the chemical industry, yeah. and for private homes, the same thing. We discussed it already. Even more problematic in some sense. There's seventy percent for space heat and 14% for hot water. Yeah. And the, the pity is that it is avoidable. So if you take um, a state-of-the-art house like the one that I'm about to show, so what this, what I show here is the first passive house. And um, the man uh, I show is Wolfgang Feist, who uh, as a young postdoctor, no, I think as a young doctoral student, um, designed this house. And the, the challenge at that time was that uh, the components for, that uh, for such houses were not available. So they kind of had to find workarounds at every um, at every corner, um, but they showed that it is possible to decrease the, um, the amount of, um, of, of, of heating energy by, yeah, by, by more than 90% actually. Yeah? And the total, um, the total um, savings could be as much as almost 90%. Yeah? So this was shown, now I don't remember when this house was. Uh, I was a student, I read it in, um, in the Physik Journal, um, or the Physikalische Blätter at that time. Um, so uh, in the middle of the 90s, I think this house was built. Yeah? And uh, of course, meanwhile, uh, all these components uh, are quite easily available. And, um, yeah, and if you look at this house, this is also a passive house. Yeah, so you, don't, you wouldn't guess uh, just from looking at the house that it is, well, a kind of special. This is actually, it is actually my house here uh, that I'm showing. Yeah, so this, we built a passive house. Um, okay, well, so um, everybody would say, well, then let's get our houses to the state of the art and we really solve one of the huge problems. Well, the sad news is that this is not possible and I'll show you why this is not possible. Uh, and to this end, I show this, the statistics um, of, of buildings in Germany. Uh, 
So a statistics of buildings here. And so the different, um, the different um, colors here, they correspond to the year when these houses were built. Yeah? So you see, you see uh, these 8%, uh, they are really old. Yeah? So before nine, before, um, yeah, so. Ah, yeah. So this one here, yep. Yeah. So once again, this is the statistics of buildings in Germany. And you find uh, that, I think it goes like this, yeah. Uh, you find that 13% are actually older than 100 years. Yeah? And it is not easily possible to bring these houses to the state of the art. And sometimes you don't want to do that. Yeah? If you have a pretty house with a pretty facade, historic facade, then you don't want to bring insulation on top of it. Yeah? So you have to do it in a very clever way. Um, actually, they tried that in Rodenburg. So you know this uh, famous German city, medieval city. They tried uh, to, to insulate these houses. Well, of course, not from outside, because then the pretty city would have been gone. So this tourist place would have lost um, much of its, um, of its attraction. So they put the insulation inside. But they didn't know how to do it properly in the 70s. It was after the oil crisis that they tried to do that. And so they had condensing water, which destroyed these houses um, yeah, or damaged them. And they had to to find other solutions. But nowadays, uh, this problem is solved, but it's still expensive. Yeah? So then we have another 12% of houses built between the two wars, basically. And then we have a major share of houses here, 38% um, that were built, well, pretty much before the oil crisis. And they were built accordingly. Yeah, so they were built with cheap oil in mind. And uh, this is a huge problem. Yeah? So even if you would have all the money of the world, it would not be possible to solve this problem in a timely manner. Why? Because we, do, uh, we don't even have enough workforce and enough companies in order to do that. Yeah? So what has been built in the course of generations can't be fixed in the course of a few years. Yeah? This must be entirely clear. Yeah? So there are some things um, where I just have to say, well, you can only try to deal with the problem to, well, if you need to heat these homes and if you need to convert high quality energy and low quality energy, then what you could at least do is to heat these houses and at the same time produce electricity yeah, by not just stupidly burn the gas, but by running a motor with an efficiency of, say, 25% or 30% electrical efficiency and use the exhaust to heat the home. And then the total efficiency is close to 100%. And you have used the potential of these high quality um, um, energy carriers to produce high quality energy in the form of electricity. OK, there's another thing that I would like to quickly discuss. And this is the so-called rebound effect. Yeah? So what we were starting to discuss here is that we try to increase the efficiency and hope that the um, that energy that primary energy consumption goes down well um, a slide uh, for that yeah so whom you see here is william stanley chevens or chevens yeah um, um, an english yeah, uh, theorist, 
And he discovered, he discovered that the increase in efficiency for the steam engines in his age, right, in his area, um, that the, the increase in efficiency of steam engines didn't result in lower consumption of coal, but quite in the contrary, it increased the consumption of coal. Yeah? And this is called Chevin's paradox um, or the rebound effect. And uh, for the rebound effect, we can distinguish different forms. Yeah? So there are different um, ways on how this can happen that um, you think that you made, uh, that you created a more economical technology and safe energy, but in the contrary, more energy is used. For example, you buy a refrigerator to replace your old one. Um, and um, whereas the old had energy class D, now you have A double plus energy class. So you decide that you can afford also a little bit larger refrigerator, right? And then a share of the savings are already lost. And uh, then when you get it, then you say, well, my old refrigerator uh, still works. I still use it for this or that, yeah? And uh, yeah. And then uh, we have the problem. Or um, my family actually decided to replace one of our cars by an electric car. So we bought an electric car. It's a lot of fun to drive with this, with this uh, little car. Um, I just show here. So I can't. Yeah, so I didn't explain anything to the slide so far. I just told you stories here. Um, so we uh, decided to, to buy an electric car. And what did we do with the old car? We gave it to our daughter. Yeah? So this is a typical example of a rebound uh, effect. On the other hand, she would have bought uh, one in due time anyway. OK, well, this is. Um, um, Chevens, and what you see here is what's wrong now. Now uh, I, I can see the slides, but can't, can, you can't see me. Now it should be okay. It's just black screen. Oh, yeah. So the camera, the camera is, let's see. Okay, we have a technical problem. Hmm. Hmm, let me look. I'm afraid that the battery ran out. Somebody unplugged the cameras, and now the batteries are out of power. Do I find? Well, I guess this is a good uh, this is a good point to to stop the lecture here. Um, so the cameras are dark, but I think you still hear my voice. Um, so I would stop here at this point. Um, I was asked whether there is a script available. Whether there is a... Ah, yeah, energy shortage in the lecture about renewable energy. Yeah, so this makes sense, right? Um, thank you for this comment. <laughs> uh, anyway, so um, we stop here at this point. 
Um, there, um, I have a script, but this starts only at chapter two. We need to finish up uh, chapter one next time. Um, I would also like to encourage you to, um, to come. Yeah, so today there's just one student uh, attending. You just need to uh, mail uh, to my secretary and, um, and then she would mail you back how many are there and whether we still can admit you. With this, I thank you for your atten uh, attention and uh, well, we'll pay attention to the better